Hello and welcome. My name is Fred Kusumoto and I am the program chair for HRS 2020 Science. I am honored to be the moderator for the third of four late-breaking clinical trial sessions that are being presented at HRS 2020 Science. This session is entitled All About Atrial Fibrillation. As you all know, AF is the most common arrhythmic problem that our patients develop and that we must in turn manage. This session has presentations of five studies that address different aspects of AF. What is the likelihood of developing silent brain infarcts in the patient with AF? Can we use biomarkers to predict the likelihood of developing AF? Are new generation left atrial appendage closure devices effective? What is the impact of atrial fibrosis on the development of AF and the likelihood of recurrent stroke? And finally, what is the impact of new technologies for esophageal protection of AF ablation efficacy? The format of each presentation begins with the investigator discussing the study using the traditional format. This is followed by Hawk and Dove commentaries that provide different views and perspectives on the importance and clinical impact of the study. I hope you enjoy this session and the important potential implications of each of these studies on our treatment in patients with atrial fibrillation. I look forward to a robust discussion on HRS 365 after you have had the chance to review the following presentations. Hi, I'm Mark Gallagher. I'm presenting on behalf of these co-authors some additional results from the IMPACT study. We know that esophageal injury is very important in AF ablation. We have always used these unproven strategies. We also have known that cooling the esophagus shows signs of effectiveness, but very weak signs. Now, this is inevitably weak because it's a weak method. We went looking for a more powerful one, and in the intensive care just down the corridor, I found my friend Dr. Al Subai using this device, the Enzo ETM from Attune Medical, to control patients' body temperature. So it was an easy jump to using it to control the local temperature near the site of ablation to protect the esophagus. He was using it to cool patients. In designing our trial, we calculated a need for 120 patients, 60 in each group, uh, to have a good probability of obtaining significant results. We did not anticipate that a lot of patients, having had their procedure, uh, would choose not to come back for their endoscopy. So in the end, we had to recruit 188 patients in total uh, to achieve the 120 with full endoscopic results. Patients who did not have the protection device had our standard of care, which is just an esophageal temperature probe, a single point probe, uh, and, and a device designed more for anesthetic use than for ablation. Patients who had the protection had the Enzo ETM device placed in the esophagus once we were finished with the transesophageal echo. We don't use intracardiac echo, so we use the transesophageal to guide the transeptal. And once we're done with that, we take the transesophageal echo probe out and put the Enzo ETM down. When I say we, that is done by the anesthetist. It goes down more easily than a transesophageal echo probe. So the anesthetist can do that without interfering with the work we're doing. On the left of these x-ray images, you see a device in its proper position. There's a little x-ray marker that shows it below the diaphragm. On the right, you see one sitting too high, and we had to put this down an additional 10 centimeters before we started work. In our trial, all of our patients had ablation guided by ablation index methodology. We used fairly standard settings. In fact, these standard settings that we used at the time, 30 watts, um, posteriorly, 40 watts anteriorly, aiming for ablation index of 350 to 400 and 450 to 500 respectively. We were careful with lesion positioning. 
we aimed for a distance of four to five millimeters between the centers of lesions. We used a three millimeter radius marker on the carter and aimed to build up the sort of lesion clusters that you see. Um, a single lesion set around each pair of veins, the right and left, a little bit of wasting at the carina rather than a big single circle. That's for the paroxysmals. For the persistence, we generally, if we had time, also did a roof line and a low posterior line to achieve complete dissociation of the posterior wall, demonstrable um, on a mapping catheter placed there, as well as a mitral line and a cava tricuspid isthmus line. All patients had an endoscopy at around a week post-procedure. They were quantified very carefully by Dr. Hyatt and Dr. Louis Auguste, and they used a classification which is a refinement of the Kansas City classification designed for this study. Study population is a familiar one, a fairly typical AF ablation population, half and half paroxysmals and persistence. We've already presented these results, significant protection against thermal injuries visible in the esophagus and a strong trend toward protection against gastroparesis in the patients who had the NVTM. Procedural parameters were not affected. We got the procedures done as quickly without additional complications and we achieved first pass connection, first pass isolation just as frequently with or without thermal protection. And we isolated the posterior wall just as often. And this is the additional stuff that we haven't been able to show before. We've processed all of the ablation index data from this case series. And we find that we do not need to burn anymore. So having cooling in the esophagus does not make us need more burning in the atrium to achieve the lesions to create the block. We were afraid it would. We were afraid that we would need longer RF duration or more force or a higher power or just a bigger RF index to create the lesions we needed to achieve our endpoints, but it was not so. Cooling the esophagus does not appear to make it harder to create your endpoints. And this is a graphical demonstration of the same detail. The RF deliveries, the contact force, the impedance, and the posterior wall lesion delivery, ablation index, um, in the control group and the protected group, showing no significant difference in any of these. It also does not affect our clinical results. We are achieving clinical success just as frequently in the protected and as in the unprotected group. And we don't have any increase in significant complications. We looked at patient symptoms with a structured questionnaire um, at around a week post ablation. In fact, two structured questionnaires, one for reflux symptoms one focused on uh, gastroparesis type symptoms. There was no significant difference, but there was a trend toward more gastroparesis symptoms um, in the control group of the moderate and severe. So in conclusion, esophageal temperature control using the ENZO-ETM device makes ablation safer, but it does not alter its effectiveness. Thank you. Hi, I'm Christine Albert, and I have the pleasure of presenting a commentary on this very important randomized trial in AF ablation. The IMPACT study tested a novel method of esophageal protection during AF ablation. Now, esophageal atrial fistula, although it is rare, remains one of the most feared and lethal complications of AF ablation. For this reason, several techniques have been utilized to minimize esophageal injury, including proton pump inhibitors, esophageal temperature monitoring, mechanical deviation of the esophagus, 
decreasing power delivery and contact force to the posterior wall, and cooling the esophagus most recently in the study. Now, because it's a rare endpoint, it's very hard to understand the efficacy of a lot of these methods because it just doesn't happen that often. So what these authors did in the main trial was they did endoscopy in all of the patients so that they could document whether there was thermal injury. And I have to congratulate them on pulling off such an important trial. The main trial results were presented at AHA in 2019, and they randomized a total of 180 patients to this novel device that, control, that cooled the esophagus during our fibrillation or atrial fibrillation. And they ended up with 120 endoscopies at the end, one to one. And they demonstrated that there was significant protection against thermal mucosal injury of the esophagus on endoscopy in the patients who were randomized to the cooling device. So what's new in this presentation? On well, this presentation, they present the results of the ablation efficacy. And so the investigators were concerned that by cooling the esophagus, it would mean that it required more ablation in order to make persistent lesions. And so what they did is they used an ablation index technology in order to guide their ablation. And the ablation index guided ablation was performed in both groups. And this is a weighted propensity formula that incorporates power, contact force, and time as a marker of ablation lesion quality. And it's been correlated with lesion depth in preclinical studies. So what they found was that there was no difference in the mean RF lesion time, the average contact force, impedance, left atrial posterior wall, ablation index in the protected and the control groups. They also found no difference in arrhythmia recurrence in the two groups. Again, very small, 60 each, um, well actually 188 for the whole study. Um, but still small, but no differences in occurrences. So they found that cooling the esophagus did not increase the need for more RF to achieve standard AF ablation endpoints. So this is good news. This technology was found to be effective against um, esophageal injury, and at the same time, it doesn't interfere with the ablation. So it is something that could be utilized potentially. Now, whether it prevents esophageal atrial fistula, again, is going to be very difficult to test in a randomized trial, but we need larger studies looking at these sorts of endpoints, um, but this is a promising technology, and I congratulate the authors on performing the study. Thank you for your attention. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, with great pleasure, I comment on Dr. Gallagher's presentation, Improving Esophageal Protection During Atrial Ablation with the Ablation Index Technology. We all know that atrial ablation is more and more frequently used to treat patients with atrial fibrillation and that esophageal protection is important in improving the safety of AF ablation. So far, there are many ideas, but most of them are unproven. Before, Dr. Gallagher showed that using the ENSO ETM, which is currently routinely used to warm or cool in the intensive care units, is effective when applied for local cooling and the ablations, less and less severe trauma in several years. Now their aim is to assess the efficacy of atrial ablation using such a tool. It is really a well-designed but small trial. Two times 60 patients, routinely treated patients versus those patients treated with the cooling, the locally cooling device. And now they show indeed comparable efficacy as far as the ablation procedure is concerned. The same power, same number um, and the same duration of RF uh, applications and so on. Also, the same success rate of atrial ablation and the occurrence of maize. However, of course, this was a small trial. Some concerns are still present. Is it really an easy to use tool? How do you know whether you are in the right position? Dr. Gallagher showed an example that they had to reposition. Is the efficacy really comparable? efficacy and maintenance rate of sinus rhythm. Probably these were selected patients. And of course, Dr. Gallagher and his team had the experience 
how will this translate into clinical practice? And for that reason, indeed, more data have to be collected in a larger studies as the authors now aim to do. And in my view, also in a multi-center trial to prove its applicability in clinical practice. Nevertheless, this, these data are a major step forward in improving treatment of patients with ablation, predominantly due to improving safety, the major concern, trauma of the esophagus. Thank you for your attention. Dear Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of my co-investigators, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to present our data on the incidence of silent brain infarcts in anticoagulated patients with atrial fibrillation. My name is David Conan and I'm presenting on behalf of the Swiss AF investigators. In the previous cross-sectional study, we observed a high burden of vascular brain lesions on magnetic resonance imaging in patients with atrial fibrillation. Most of these brain lesions were clinically silent. Silent brain infarcts had a similar association with lower cognitive scores as overt strokes, raising the possibility that silent brain damage causes an increased risk of cognitive dysfunction in patients with atrial fibrillation, just as the body of an iceberg below the water surface. In this context, however, a prospective study is needed to determine the exact incidence of new brain lesions over time in AF patients and to provide evidence on the association of silent brain infarcts with cognitive decline. Within the Swiss AF cohort, we prospectively followed for two years 1737 AF patients with an available baseline brain MRI. Of these patients, 1227 obtained the second brain MRI after two years of follow-up, which is about 71% of the original participants. Yearly cognitive testing was done using four validated cognitive tests. Large non-cortical or cortical infarcts, or LNCCIs, and small non-cortical infarcts, or SNCIs, were quantified by a central core laboratory. Clinically silent brain infarcts were defined as new infarcts in patients without an intercurrent stroke or TIA between the baseline visit and the two-year MRI. Only new lesions that were not present at baseline were considered in this analysis. Here the baseline characteristics of the 1227 included patients. Mean age at baseline was 71 years, 26% were female, Mean blood pressure at baseline was 135 over 79 millimeters of mercury. 47% had paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. 19% had a history of congestive heart failure. The median Chad's VASC score at baseline was 3.0. 90% of all participants were anticoagulated at baseline and 84% were anticoagulated at the two-year follow-up visit. 17% were an antiplatelet treatment at baseline. Here our main results on the incidence of new brain infarcts during two years of follow-up. You can see in the blue bars the number of brain lesions obtained on the two-year MRI studies. There were a total of 28 or 2.3 percent of participants having an intercurrent clinical stroke or TIA during follow-up. There were 36 LNCCIs on the two-year brain MRI, or 2.9%. 37 or 3% of SNCIs, as shown in the right graph. The red bars 
in the graph show patients with a new lesion who did not have an intercurrent stroke or TIA. And the green bars show those patients who were taking oral anticoagulation during the follow-up visit and still having a brain infarct on the MRI. Of the 68 unique participants who had a new brain infarct on the MRI, 58 or 85 percent had a silent event. Of the 68 unique patients with a new brain infarct, 59 or 87 percent were taking oral anticoagulation. Of the 68 patients with a new brain infarct, 51 or 75 percent had a silent event while they were taking oral anticoagulation during follow-up. You see results on the cognitive decline in patients with versus without brain infarcts. You can see five bar charts with uh, five different test scores, including the MOCA, the TMTA, and B, the digital symbol substitution test, and the animal fluency test. On the left side of each figure, you see those patients who did not have a new brain infarct. And on the right side, you see those who had a new brain infarct. And you can see that those with a new brain infarct had a stronger change from baseline in their score, meaning they had a stronger decline in their cognitive scores throughout all five tests. Three of the five tests were statistically significant compared to those without a brain infarct. Dear Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to conclude that in Swiss AF, 5.5% of well-treated AF patients have a new brain infarct after two years of follow-up. The great majority, 75% of these infarcts, is clinically silent and occurs in patients on oral anticoagulation. New brain infarcts were significantly associated with cognitive decline, confirming our hypothesis that the events going on below the water surface may be of big clinical relevance to patients with atrial fibrillation. The further long-term consequences of silent brain infarcts will be investigated in future studies. And finally, although many AF patients benefit from oral anticoagulation, oral anticoagulation alone may not be sufficient to prevent brain damage in all patients with atrial fibrillation. Thank you. Hi, I'm Christine Alber from Cedars Sinai Hospital, and I have the pleasure of presenting a commentary on the Swiss AF study. Now the background for this very important study is that there is a relationship between atrial fibrillation and cognitive decline and dementia. And obviously that's a very concerning relationship and we'd like to learn ways to prevent that from happening. The Swiss AF study and other studies have found that there's a significant prevalence of silent brain infarcts in patients who have atrial fibrillation. And so it's been postulated that these silent infarcts may underlie the association between atrial fibrillation and cognitive decline and dementia. So this study took the next step and looked at what was the incidence in a rigorous fashion of new silent infarcts in patients with atrial fibrillation. And so this is the largest study to rigor rigorously examine this question and found that in a total of 1,227 patients that had two MRIs, two years apart, and cognitive assessments, that there was a significant proportion of strokes that occurred in this population at about 5.5% new infarcts at two years. Now, first, I have to congratulate these authors in pulling off such a huge study. I mean, to do two MRIs in all of these patients and have cognitive assessments is a huge feat. Now, even in this contemporary population where 85% of the people were on anticoagulation, there still was this level of stroke. 
And these new infarcts, 85% of them were silent. So they weren't clinically recognized. And 75% of these new infarcts, the patients were already on anticoagulation. And these infarcts were statistically associated with subsequent cognitive decline. So what do we learn? We learned that silent infarcts could be a possible cause, at least in part, for the cognitive decline in dementia associated with AF. But what do we need to learn more? Well, we need to learn more about the therapeutic implications. Um, because these patients, most of them were on anticoagulation, what are our possible therapeutic options to help to prevent this? So we need to know, number one, was there differences by type of anticoagulation? Is there a benefit for the NOAX versus warfarin? If they were on warfarin, was there a relationship with time to therapeutic ratio? In addition, what about our treatments for defibrillation? Prior studies have suggested that patients who have ablations have a significant proportion of these silent infarcts. Do, whether these patients were treated with ablation or medications or rate control in those two years impact whether they had infarcts. And then finally, what are the risk factors of the patient themselves? Type, duration of AF, and other risk factors like hypertension, diabetes, um, other etiologies for these strokes that might not be prevented with anticoagulation. All of these questions are good questions for the chat that'll happen later on. But in the end, I just want to congratulate the authors for doing such a well done, large, multi center study. Thank you for your attention. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that I comment on the data of Dr. Conan, the incidence of silent brain infarction and their possible association with cognitive dysfunction. We all know since only a short time that silent brain lesions occur frequently and seem to have a similar association with cognitive dysfunction as overt stroke. And now it was their aim to prospectively determine the incidence of new brain infarctions and provide more robust data on its association with cognitive dysfunction. Indeed, they were successful in including a large and prospective cohort, over 1,200 patients, who underwent a baseline MRI and five cognitive tests that all were repeated after two years of follow-up. Note that they included a selected group of patients, especially elderly, over uh, 70 years of age, low risk and predominantly male, almost no women included, with both paroxysmal and persistent AF and 84% on anticoagulants. 5% showed new brain infarcts and 75% of those 5% were silent and occurred while being on anticoagulants. And they conclude that their new brain infarct, the new silent brain infarcts were associated with cognitive decline. In my view, not a very strong association. Very interesting data, important data, large cohort, large and prospective cohort, but no data on time in the therapeutic range for warfarin, nor adherence to notes. How many patients were actually on NOAX? No information on concurrent events, heart failure, hospitalizations, MIs, cancer, infections, and neither on medications. And where the comorbidities optimally treated or where the differences between patients with and without brain infarctions. And was there any association uh, with intercurrent events? And finally, and I want to stress that their association with cognitive decline, in my view, is not very robust as these and the data showed. Nevertheless, important new data. We await their further analysis. Thank you. On behalf of the Pinnacle Flex investigators, I present to you the primary outcome evaluation of a next generation LAAC device, the Pinnacle Flex trial. These are the relevant disclosures for this presentation. Watchman Flex has CE mark approval, but does not have FDA approval at the time of this presentation. It was 15 years ago that Protect AF, the first randomized trial using Watchman LAA closure, was initiated, ultimately leading to FDA approval in 2015. And now over 100,000 cases have been done using this first generation device. <clears throat> 
Watchman Flex is a next generation device designed to improve procedural performance, safety, and expand the eligible patient population. Compared to the first generation device, the Watchman Flex has greater number of struts, closed distal end, dual row anchors, ability to fully recapture and reposition, and reduce metal exposure. The Pinnacle Flex study is a single arm prospective non-randomized study design with a post-implant drug regimen being DOAC only. And the device is compared to a performance goal based on the current generation watchman. 400 patients were enrolled at 29 US sites. And the objective is to establish the safety and effectiveness of the Watchman Flex LAAC device for patients with non-valvular AFib who are eligible for anticoagulation therapy to reduce the risk of stroke. The follow-up is up to 24 months and transesophageal echoes are performed at 45 days and at 12 months. And the post-implant antithrombotic regimen consists of DOAC plus aspirin for 45 days, followed by clopidogrel plus aspirin until six months and aspirin indefinitely. You can see here that 13 sites enrolled at least 10 patients each. The primary efficacy endpoint is a rate of effective LAA closure defined as any peri device flow less than or equal to five millimeters demonstrated by TEE at 12 months. The secondary efficacy endpoint is the occurrence of ischemic stroke or systemic embolism at 24 months from the time of enrollment. And the primary safety endpoint is the occurrence of one of the following events between time of implant and within seven days of the procedure, including all cause death, ischemic stroke, systemic embolism, or device or procedure related events. In terms of baseline demographics, the mean age was 74, the mean Chaz Vasque and Hasbled were 4.2 and 2.0 respectively, 22% had a previous stroke, TIA, or thromboembolism and 33% had some prior major bleeding or predisposition to bleeding. Implant success defined a successful delivery and release of the Watchman Flex into the LAA was 99%. There was an average of 1.2 devices used per case, and you can see that full recaptures were not typically required as the device could be navigated in the LAA using partial recaptures. In terms of the primary effectiveness endpoint, the rate of effective LAA closure at 12 months was 100%, which was better than our performance goal, yielding a statistically significant p-value. But if we look at the detailed LAA closure assessment, 99% of patients had adequate TEEs for evaluation at 12 months, and of these 99% of patients, 100% of them had a jet size less than or equal to 5 millimeters. Beyond that, 90% of these patients had a complete seal that is no identifiable leak during transesophageal echo at 12 months. And if you compare that to protective and prevail, at 12 months, this was 67%. In terms of the primary safety endpoint, which is the occurrence of one of these following between time of implant and seven days, that is death, ischemic stroke, or systemic embolism, or device or procedure related events, the safety endpoint event rate was 0.5%, again, significantly better than the performance goal with a statistically significant p-value, and these two events were ischemic stroke. One patient had an ischemic stroke one day after an unsuccessful procedure, resulting in a new visual field deficit, and the second patient had an ischemic stroke two days after procedure, resulting in minimal residual symptoms or an MRS of one at discharge. 97% of patients were on apixaban or rivaroxaban for the first 45 days post-implant, and 96% of patients had their OACs discontinued at 45-day follow-up. Here we present the 12-month adjudicated major clinical events, but note that the secondary efficacy endpoint of stroke or systemic embolism in 24 months will not be presented here as the data is still being collected, and event rates from Pinnacle Flex trial are reported here as Kaplan-Meier estimates, not rate per 100 patient years, and this is different from previous Watchman trials due to the relatively small sample size and limited duration of follow-up. You see there were no cases of hemorrhagic stroke and 2.6% had ischemic stroke. There were no device embolizations in this trial. There were four pericardial effusions requiring pericardiosynthesis 
but none requiring open cardiac surgery. And if you look at the timing of strokes and pericardial effusions, there was one pericardial effusion one year post implant, which occurred during catheter ablation. There were seven DRTs or device related thrombus noted in this trial at 12 months, which is 1.8%. And two of these were associated with stroke or systemic embolism. In summary, the Pinnacle Flex study met the primary safety endpoint with 0.5% experiencing an event, met the primary effectiveness endpoint with 100% of patients having adequate closure, and follow-up is ongoing until all patients reach the 24-month window. In conclusion, the Watchman Flex, in combination with a six-week post-procedural regimen of a DOAC and low-dose aspirin, is associated with a low rate of safety events and high rates of effective appendage closure. Thank you. Hi, I'm Christine Albert, and I have the pleasure of presenting a commentary on this very important trial presented by Dr. Doshi, the Pinnacle Flex Next Generation Watchman Left Atrial Appendage Closure Trial. Now, this trial tested a second generation left atrial closure device that was redesigned to provide more maneuverability to achieve optimal positioning and more effective sealing of the left atrial appendage, particularly shallow appendages. Now you can see on the slide the two devices are side by side and you can see why the newer device might be better in a shallow appendage and also might have a more effective seal. So they tested this device in a pretty high risk population. The mean CHAS-VAS score was 4.2, 22% had had a prior stroke, and 33% had a major bleed. They used a DOAC instead of warfarin uh, compared to the prior trials, and they treated patients with this for six weeks. They met their primary efficacy endpoint, which was the rate of effective left atrial appendage closure, which was seen in 100% with jet size less than five millimeters at 12 months. Now this compares to 66% with the first generation, so a big improvement. And their primary seven day safety endpoint demonstrated two out of 400 strokes. There were also four pericardial effusions, three of which were around the time of the implant. And again, there's not a control group, but within the realm of what they had predicted. And there's 24 month follow-up ongoing for secondary efficacy endpoints of ischemic stroke or embolism. So what does the trial show? Well, the trial shows that this new device is definitely better at occluding the left atrial appendage. And what that means to not have any leak is not entirely clear. You would think that that would lower the risk of stroke, but that hasn't yet been proven. And really what we need is a hard outcome trial. And these investigators are actually doing that and they're going to be testing this next device in a big randomized trial called the CHAMPION trial. And this trial is gonna to move to the next patient population that don't necessarily have a contraindication to anticoagulation and actually can be treated long-term with a NOAC. And so they'll be randomized one-to-one, -one, Watchman Flex versus the NOAC, 3,000 participants, chas -Vast greater than two, and they'll have a 36-month co-primary endpoint of ischemic stroke systemic embolism. And they're gonna follow these patients out for five years to see how the risks of bleeding associated with the anticoagulation stack up to the stroke prevention in these patients. In addition, there will be another trial, the Catalyst trial, by another group of investigators that will be in the same number of patients, randomized one-to-one -one with a slightly higher chas vast score of three. And this will be testing the amulet device with an ILAC. And this trial will have two years of follow-up. So hopefully with these two trials, we'll get a sense of how this device, these devices can be utilized in patients who might not want to be on anticoagulation, um, but don't have a definite contraindication. I appreciate your attention and I congratulate the authors for this very important study. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, with great pleasure, I report on the very interesting data of the primary outcome of the next generation left atrial appendage closure device, the Watchman Flex. We all know that prevention of stroke is a major aim in patients with atrial fibrillation. NOACs nowadays are very effective, but some patients have contraindications because of the severe bleeding risk or just prefer to use aspirin in combination with the left atrial appendage closure device 
instead of lifelong anticoagulation with warfarin or NOAC. This Watchman Flex device is a new generation device supposed to be more effective and safer, and that was the aim of the investigators. Well, some comments. Only a few patients were included, and the data provided now are only on one year follow up. There's no real comparison with, with the old Watchman device, and neither with other left atrial appendage closure devices nor with patients being treated with anticoagulants and NOAs. Were the patients comparable, uh, for example? Because although the patients included in the present registry are at risk for both stroke and bleeding, there are relatively low risk, yet FELSC only four has bled rather low too. Thus, these patients cannot be compared with part of the patients that really are candidates for a left atrial appendage closure device. Well, the device was effective, 100% closure and 90% even had a complete seal. The, um, the investigators are congratulated uh, for that result. But of course, most of the devices were implanted in large volumes, volume centers with experience and again, in relatively low patients. What would be the success rate in higher risk patients and also in lower volume centers? The secondary endpoint, the most important one of ischemic stroke and systemic embolism is not yet assessed. Indeed, it's too short follow-up, but these results are eagerly awaited. The primary safety endpoint was, was very, very uh, good and, and very low, 0.5%. Congratulations. Nevertheless, I would be very, see, very interested to see what would be this rate in higher risk patients, those patients, in fact, who really are candidates and warrant a left atrial appendage closure device. But nevertheless, and above all, this is very interesting and a promising device, a well done study, and the authors are congratulations with their first results and the follow up, the other data are eagerly awaited. Thank you for your attention. Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to this presentation. On behalf of my co-investigators, I'm very pleased to share with you the results of our study. This work was supported in part by the John Locke Charitable Fund. All of the other investigators have Embolic stroke of undetermined source, also known as ESIS, is really a big challenge for neurologists and electrophysiologists. This group of strokes accounts for up to 25% of all ischemic strokes in the United States. Atrial fibrillation is often suspected in ESIS. However, the yield of diagnostic rhythm monitoring in this population is relatively low. In the Crystal AF study, it was found to be about 30% after three years of monitoring using an implantable loop recorder. This and other findings have led to alternative hypotheses linking atrial disease or fibrosis to ESIS, independent of atrial fibrillation. Our hypothesis in this study is that atrial fibrosis underlies both ischemic stroke and atrial fibrillation. To this end, we conducted our study as follows. We enrolled 201 participants from three clinical centers. Clinicum Coburg in Germany, the University of Utah, and the University of Washington here in the United States. While the focus of our study was ESIS, we selected different comparison groups, including first, a non-AFib, non-stroke control group. Second, a lacunar stroke group, which was specifically selected due to the fact that cardiac thromboembolization is not a mechanism for this type of stroke. And then two additional groups that are both atrial fibrillation, one with and another without a prior history of ischemic stroke. All the participants in our study provided informed consent and they all underwent atrial late gadolinium enhancement MRI for atrial fibrosis assessment. AFib patients underwent their MRI as part of their standard of care prior to any catheter ablation procedure. ESIS patients, in particular, were followed prospectively for two clinically important endpoints. The first was recurrent ischemic stroke 
and the second was new onset atrial fibrillation. These are the cohort characteristics. Notable differences, mostly due to the non-matched nature of the participant selection, include a slightly older patient population in the ESAs and AFib groups compared to the other groups, a higher prevalence of hypertension in the ESAs and AFib groups compared to the others, a higher prevalence of female gender in the AFib patients with prior stroke, and this is consistent with prior knowledge of higher stroke risk in women with atrial fibrillation. Next, let's look at the degree of fibrosis between the groups. As you can see in the table, there's an increase in fibrosis from control patients to lacunar strokes to ESIS and AFib groups. In the box plot, you can also readily see that ESIS patients in the middle have significantly higher fibrosis compared to healthy controls and lacunar stroke patients. These same ESIS patients, on the other hand, have indistinguishable atrial fibrosis burdens compared to the AFib groups. Next, we looked at recurrent stroke or new atrial fibrillation in the ESIS group. After 30 months of follow-up, five recurrent strokes occurred in 51 ESIS patients, and that's 9.8%. The median time to recurrent stroke was seven months from the initial stroke and the average atrial fibrosis for the recurrent stroke group was about 16%. Similarly, five patients were diagnosed with atrial fibrillation during this follow-up period. The average time to diagnosis of AFib was 18 months, or a year and a half from the initial stroke. The average atrial fibrosis for this group was about 20%. Patients who were diagnosed with atrial fib were switched from aspirin to oral anticoagulation for secondary stroke prevention. Now, two patients had both outcomes, recurrent stroke and atrial fib, unfortunately diagnosed simultaneously with an average fibrosis for these patients of 17.5%. Next, we tried to identify a high-risk group for the combined endpoint of recurrent stroke or atrial fibrillation, keeping in mind that the goal for these ESIS patients is to reduce the risk of recurrent stroke, which can be achieved with oral anticoagulation. Now, we had previously published a smaller study of fibrosis in ESIS patients, which suggested that 12% fibrosis was a good cutoff that created good separation between ESIS patients and controls. So we used that same cutoff value on our current cohort of 51 ESIS patients and divided them into two groups, 20 patients with fibrosis less than 12% and 31 patients with fibrosis greater or equal to 12%. Now, during prospective follow-up, one patient out of 20 in the low fibrosis group had recurrent stroke or atrial fibrillation, whereas seven patients out of 31, or 22.6%, in the higher fibrosis group had recurrent stroke or atrial fibrillation. That proportional difference was statistically significant and was associated with a likelihood ratio of 3.2 and a p-value of 0.04. Next, we performed a Kaplan-Meier analysis and generated survival curves for these two fibrosis groups. As you can clearly see, the curves separate early and seem to continue to separate over time. However, the statistical test of significance did not reach the 0.05 traditional cutoff. We performed a univariate Cox regression analysis to study the association of clinical and imaging parameters with the combined outcome. Of note, none of the clinical parameters, including the composite CHATS2 VASC score, was predictive of recurrent stroke or new atrial fib. Atrial size, volume, index to the body surface area in this case, was also not predictive. Atrial fibrosis above 12% was associated with a hazard ratio of 4.3 for the combined outcome. However, that did not reach statistical significance, even though it was trending in that direction. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, our study shows that ESIS is associated with a high atrial fibrosis burden, similar to that seen in atrial fibrillation. A high fibrosis burden greater than 12% was associated with a higher likelihood of recurrent stroke or new atrial fibrillation. We are planning prospective studies of ESIS patients where fibrosis will be used to select patients for OR anticoagulation for secondary stroke prevention.
As we all know, two recent studies have failed to show the value of unselected anticoagulation, and we believe that atrial fibrosis will identify ESIS patients who may benefit from an anticoagulation strategy for secondary stroke prevention. I'd like to thank everyone for your attention, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Hi, this is Christine Albert, and I have the pleasure of presenting a commentary on this very provocative study that examined the association between left atrial fibrosis, atrial fibrillation, and recurrent stroke in patients with embolic stroke of unknown source, ESIS. Now, currently, the standard of care for anticoagulation in these patients is aspirin, but the recurrence rate of stroke remains relatively high. We also know that if AF is detected clinically in these patients, that they benefit from anticoagulation. And there have been studies using implantable loop recorders that have documented that as much as 30% of patients with ESIS might have atrial fibrillation detected. So there was a lot of enthusiasm about going ahead and anticoagulating these patients because perhaps even a greater burden of them might have atrial fibrillation. Unfortunately, they found that in two large scale studies, navigate ESIS and respect ESIS, that normal anticoagulants did not benefit the patients compared to aspirin in unselected ESIS patients. So these authors embarked on a study to look at whether atrial fibrosis could be utilized to identify a subset of patients who might benefit from anticoagulation. And so what they did is they measured atrial fibrosis using cardiac MRI in 50 ESIS patients and compared it to patients with lacuna stroke, controls, and patients with AF with and without stroke, and they had two central findings. The first, they found that the atrial fibrosis in the ESIS patients was greater than that in lacunar stroke patients or in controls, and was much more similar to patients with atrial fibrillation with and without stroke that would benefit from anticoagulation. Second, they found that a cutoff of fibrosis greater than 12% in the left atrium was associated with a trend toward an increased risk of a combined endpoint of atrial fibrillation and stroke. And again, this was a small study and it wasn't significant in all the analyses. So what do we learn? Well, this small study is suggestive that significant atrial fibrosis might be useful in ESIS patients to help identify those who will go on to develop AF and CEA. Now, how, what are the implications? Well, it would be useful to be able to predict who would go on to get atrial fibrillation clinically because then this could help us to treat these patients with anticoagulation because we know that patients who've had a stroke who have AF benefit from anticoagulation. However, an association with, between fibrosis and stroke without atrial fibrillation, it's really unclear if those patients necessarily will benefit from anticoagulation. So the authors are correct that the next step is really to do a randomized trial where you take patients with a great amount of fibrosis who have ESIS and randomize them to a NOAC versus aspirin and see if they do derive benefit. And I encourage the authors to go forward with this trial and I congratulate them on this important advance in this area. Thank you for your attention. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to comment on these data on how atrial fibrosis may predict recurrent stroke and new atrial fibrillation in patients who suffer from ESIS and bollock stroke of unknown source. ESIS patients indeed are nowadays an enormous challenge. AF is often suspected, but the yield of monitoring is rather low. And if it is associated with AF, then treatment with oral anticoagulants is warranted. However, recent trials randomizing ESIS patients to either a NOAC or aspirin were ne negative. The hypothesis of the present study is that now in selected ESIS patients, may, NOACs may become uh, effective. And that are the patients who show an atrial cardiomyopathy, atrial fibrosis, because that may be associated with both atrial fibrillation and uh, with stroke. It's an interesting design with patients with and without atrial fibrillation, healthy controls, different types of strokes, also lacunar strokes. Important differences, however, between the groups were 
shown. The eases group rather in the middle between patients with and without atrial fibrillation, but there was an important high rate of hyperlipidemia in eases patients. Why is that? Also much higher in the patients with atrial fibrillation who already suffered from stroke. And how did it affect outcome? Indeed, atrial fibrosis was higher in the eases as compared to the healthy controls and lacunar stroke patients, and more or less comparable to AVF patients with or without part of stroke. Very interesting. But I have some problems with that 12% cutoff of atrial fibrosis. Rather low and how reproducible to assess. And what's the role of the atrial size in combination with the percentage of atrial fibrosis? Does it matter whether the size of the left atrium is small or large? Indeed, in eases patients, there seems to be an association with a higher fibrosis percentage in the occurrence of stroke or atrial fibrillation. But in my view, absolutely, absolutely not impressively shown. For example, the univariate coxogenesis analysis only suggested that association, and that also suggested an association with vascular disease, which, seem, which sounds rather okay for me. But probably the present number of patients simply were too small to show convincing results on the role of fibrosis as assessed by MRI. I just want to make one other comment. Always the MRI, and we all know how difficult to reproduce those data are, possibly also more sophisticated echocardiographic data like strain measurements may help to identify easier patients that may benefit from anticoagulation. But clearly, an atrial cardiomyopathy and a severe atrial cardiomyopathy seems to be relevant and seems to distinguish patients with a prior embolic stroke of unknown source to distinguish them who may benefit and who will not benefit from anticoagulation. Great work, my congratulations. I'd like to thank you for your attention. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of my co-authors, I would like to thank the HRS for the opportunity to present the first data from the PREDICT atrial fibrillation trial. These are my disclosures. The background of the study is that structural changes in the atrial substrate that occur before the first episode of atrial fibrillation are mainly unexplored, whereas identifying this pre-AF atrial remodeling may select patients at risk of future atrial fibrillation. And therefore, we hypothesized that structural changes within the atrium may occur long before the development of actual clinical atrial fibrillation. And that biomarkers of these changes within the atrium are predictive of new onset AF and may provide potential targets for preventive therapy. This is the study design of the PREDICT AF study. We included patients between 18 and 80 years of age with no history of atrial fibrillation who underwent elective cardiac surgery, including coronary artery bypass grafting or valve surgery or a combination of the two. Subjects had a chats vas score of at least two. Main exclusion criteria included a documented history of AF, heart failure or a redo or emergency procedure. We screened 941 patients, of whom 528 were eligible, and eventually included 150 patients who underwent elective cardiac surgery and amputation of the left atrial appendage. The first 50 days following the operation um, was designed as the post-operative AF period, and during this period, two patients died and five were lost to follow-up. Clinical follow-up at 6, 12, and 24 months included halter analysis, blood drawing, health-related quality of life, and in this period another seven patients died and eight were lost to follow-up. The primary endpoint of the study was any documented atrial tachyarrhythmia lasting longer than 30 seconds in accordance with the HRS consensus document. 22 of the excised Appendages were used for RNA sequencing and we analyzed differentially expressed genes between the patients with 
new onset atrial fibrillation and those without, and analyzed a gene set enrichment. Based on this analysis, we selected 31 genes uh, based on fault change and p-value and mostly associated with electrical or structural remodeling that were tested in the entire cohort of 150 patients and correlated with the occurrence of new onset atrial fibrillation at 24 months. We defined post-operative atrial fibrillation as any atrial tachyarrhythmia occurring within 50 days after the procedure because we observed that a considerable number of patients experienced atrial fibrillation between 30 and 50 days following the operation without experiencing any other atrial fibrillation during long-term follow-up. And those patients are indicated by the open symbols in panel A of this slide. Also, from a biological point of view, see panel B, we found that using a cutoff value of 50 days, there were far more genes that were differentially expressed between those patients who would develop late onset atrial fibrillation than those without atrial fibrillation when we used a cutoff of 50 days instead of 30 days. These are the baseline characteristics of the patients included in the trial. Mean age was 68 years, BMI was 28, left ventricular ejection fraction 48% and left atrial volume index 31 milliliter per square meter. Approximately 75% of patients underwent isolated coronary artery bypass grafting and the other 25% had a valve operation with or without CABG. The primary endpoints were post-operative and new onset atrial fibrillation. 63 patients experienced post-operative AF within 50 days and another 18% experienced atrial fibrillations after more than 50 days following their cardiac operation. 16 of those also had post-operative AF and those 18 patients were included as cases in this analysis. When we now look at the clinical factors that were associated with the development of late onset atrial fibrillation, there was a considerable hazard ratio for age and for valve surgery solitary, but none of these risk factors were significantly different between the patients with or without late onset atrial fibrillation. This volcano plot on the left here shows the um, differentially expressed genes in the 22 patients in whom RNA sequencing was performed. And these differentially expressed genes in atrial fibrillation include ion channel genes, collagens, glycoproteins and proteoglycans, and fibrogenic mediators. When we analyze these data for gene set enrichment, we found that gene sets that were enriched in atrial fibrillation were mainly associated with extracellular matrix, whereas gene sets underrepresented in atrial fibrillation included energy metabolism, fatty acid metabolism, and respiration. Then we tested 31 genes in the entire cohort of 150 patients, and we found that selected genes depicted here are differentially expressed and mainly overexpressed in patients with late onset atrial fibrillations and those genes are ascribed to extracellular matrix formation and um, KCNJ2 uh, encoding a potassium channel was underexpressed in atrial fibrillation patients. We then combined three of those differentially expressed genes in a C-statistic based area under the curve analysis and found that the area under the curve for the prediction of future AF was 82% when we included only three genes. Whereas um, if we did the same analysis for clinical risk factors, the predictive value was considerably less. This brings me to my conclusions. Predict atrial fibrillation included 150 patients without AF undergoing elective cardiac surgery and excision of the left atrial appendage. There was no difference in atrial gene expression in patients with or without post-operative atrial fibrillation occurring within 50 days after surgery. However, 18 patients developed late onset atrial fibrillations more than 50 days after the surgery and showed a significant overexpression of extracellular matrix genes and underexpression of KCNJ2. Ladies and gentlemen, these data imply 
that extracellular matrix modeling that goes beyond the deposition of collagens alone emerges long before the onset of clinical atrial fibrillation. And that when combined, the differential expression of collagen 1, 8 and KCNJ2 may predict future AF with an area under the curve of 82%. Detection of those preclinical atrial remodeling changes with specific circulating biomarkers may potentially allow prevention of future atrial fibrillation. Hi, this is Christine Albert from Cedar sinai Medical Center, and I have the opportunity of presenting a commentary on this very important study, the PREDICT AF study, where the investigators sought to determine whether there were biomarkers of atrial remodeling that might predict atrial fibrillation in patients undergoing cardiac surgery. They took left atrial tissue from 150 patients during the, at the time of cardiac surgery and followed them for post-operative AF, which they defined as less than 50 days from the operation, and late onset AF, which they defined as greater than 50 days from the operation. And they found 63 of those patients had post-operative AF and 18 had late onset AF. They then performed a discovery analysis where they used RNA sequencing in 22 of these patients. And they found that ion channel genes, collagen genes, glycoproteins, and fibrogenic mediators were differentially expressed in those with late onset AF. And they did not find any significant differences for those with post-operative AF. So then they did a gene set enrichment analysis and found that extracellular matrix genes were actually enriched in those with late onset AF, suggesting that there was remodeling of the extracellular matrix going on. They then took 31 candidate genes from those suggested by the prior discovery analysis and found that several of them were associated with late onset AF, specifically those in the extracellular matrix, ion channels, and endothelium. And then they took three of these genes and did a prediction model and found that the area under the curve was actually quite high um, compared to when you just used age, sex, and left atrial volume index. Now, what did we learn? Well, the RNA analysis is supportive of the hypothesis that prior to AF occurrence, there are electrical, because of the ion channel genes, and structural, the extracellular matrix genes, that are taking place, these changes are taking place in the atrium before uh, the atrial fibrillation occurs. Um, now, if we could understand these processes and understand the specific areas that are being upregulated, then perhaps we could interrupt them um, and again, this is way down the line, but it is a first step. Um, this study and others have pointed to the importance of the extracellular matrix and collagen deposition, along with ion channel modulation in the early stages of the development of the substrate for atrial fibrillation. Now, the prediction algorithms require a much greater sample size and also require validation. So again, this is very preliminary, and I encourage the authors to try to combine their data with others uh, to get a larger sample size and also to uh, achieve validation of their results. But in general, it's an interesting study with 150 patients who had RNA examined in their left atrium and again points to the importance of the extracellular matrix. Thank you for your attention. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure that I commence on these interesting, this interesting study of Professor de Groot from Amsterdam on the role of extracellular matrix remodeling to predict future AF. This is an interesting st uh, study because we know for long, long that structural atrial changes are present long before the first episode of atrial fibrillation, but these are largely explored. Indeed, identifying pre-AF atrial remodeling may select patients at future risk for AF, and the aim now of these investigators was to identify biomarkers of these structural changes that may provide targets for primary prevention of atrial fibrillation. It is a small cohort, 150 patients without no documented atrial fibrillation, but how sure are they? No continuous monitoring before the surgery. The majority of patients underwent cabbage, but there was a small group only undergoing valve surgery. So completely different underlying mechanism and probably underlying, but a different underlying pathophysiological mechanism. Then there the definition of POLOF, 
shorter than 50 days. That's arbitrary. And possibly, that's my concern, result driven, as they observed that with that cutoff value, more genes were differentially expressed. And then the assessment of post-operative AF early and late, no continuous monitoring, the same issue, a very important issue in my view, as before surgery. And what has been the influence of developing, developing age of fibrillation that is clinically relevant, that is that late post-operative AF after 50 days um, after surgery, on the, the risk of developing clinical relevant um, age of fibrillation after the exclusion of the left atrial appendages. How has that procedure, additional procedure during surgery affected their outcome? In the end, there were 63 patients with atrial fibrillation post-surgery and only eight cases, which means atrial fibrillation after 50 days after surgery, and that is clinically relevant AF. Indeed, they observed no clinical significant predictors, and there was no difference in atrial gene expression in patients with and without uh, postoperative AF occurring early, in their view, shorter than 50 days after surgery. Interestingly, genes did a better job to predict AF, indeed, late after surgery, and that were two extracellular matrix genes and the KCNG2 gene that predicted future AF. Despite its shortcomings, I think this study is a main step forward in identifying patients as included in this cohort. In general, there's patients with undergoing a cabbage that's with vascular disease at risk for developing future clinical relevant AF. And that's an important note. These data hold for those patients, not for example, for patients suffering from atrial fibrillation due to heart failure. Thank you for your attention. Hello, Fred Kusumoto again. I hope that you have enjoyed this session that has focused on the treatment and management of patients with atrial fibrillation. The presentations provide a broad perspective of the different issues that clinicians face with atrial fibrillation. We learned about the potential use of biomarkers for predicting the development of AF and perhaps giving us insight on potential upstream therapies for AF. We learned about the possible impact of atrial fibrosis for the development of AF and recurrent stroke. In fact, preventing stroke is one of the cornerstones of AF management, and today we learned about the frequency of silent brain infarcts in patients with atrial fibrillation, even in those patients receiving anticoagulation. In addition, data has been presented on the potential benefits of the new generation of left atrial appendage closure devices over the existing technology currently used in the United States. Finally, in those patients who undergo AF ablation, we learned that new esophageal protection devices do not appear to have an impact on the effectiveness of AF ablation. I would like to thank the presenters and the commentators for their time putting together the presentations. I would like to thank you for your attention and hope that you will go to the HRS 365 site and provide your thoughts and perspectives on these provocative studies. It is through this intercourse and discussion that new ideas are introduced and allow best practices to spread quickly in our community that in turn leads to the best care for our patients. Thank you.